A beloved young woman with a passion for helping others finally achieves her lifelong dream of becoming a teacher. When she doesn't return home from school one day, her family and friends go looking for her, while police review surveillance footage at the school and learn what one of her students had done to her that day. As the search for her continues, police discover a revolting scene that could have only been staged by an extremely sick and twisted individual. This is the story of Colleen Ritzer. Colleen Ritzer was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts on May 3, 1989 to her parents Thomas and Peggy Ritzer. She was their oldest child and had a very close bond with her two younger siblings, Daniel and Laura. As a child, Colleen was happy and outgoing and always had a positive outlook on life. She cared for people and loved to help others. Her compassion led her to find her calling at a very young age. Since preschool, Colleen always knew that she wanted to become a teacher. As she advanced in school, she found that she excelled in math and decided that when she was older, that's what she would teach. At some point, Colleen and her family moved to Danvers, Massachusetts, a small town just outside of Boston. Danvers, which was formerly known as Salem, was one of the earliest settlements during the colonial era of the United States. Its name was changed after the infamous Salem Witch Trials that took place there during which dozens of people were hanged in public after being accused of practicing witchcraft and causing others to be possessed by demons. Colleen eventually enrolled in college, where she studied education and made a bunch of lifelong friends. They described her as genuinely kind and a fun person to be around. After earning her degree at the age of 22, Colleen was hired to teach math at Danvers High School and had finally fulfilled her lifelong dream of becoming a teacher. Over the next two years, she'd proved to be a great teacher and would become popular with her students, who adored her. Colleen made math interesting and found ways to make it easy to understand. She bonded with her students and would keep in touch with them on social media posting reminders and links to helpful material. Colleen loved what she did and was very passionate about it. At just 24 years old, Colleen had a long and fulfilling career ahead of her and was looking forward to decades of teaching. Unfortunately, though, this would all come to a tragic end in the fall of 2013 after a devastating and shocking event that would rock the small town of Danvers and make national headlines. Tuesday, October 22, 2013, started off just like any other school day at Danvers High. The school was decorated and everyone was getting ready for Halloween, which was a week away. Colleen arrived at the school at 7 a.m., carrying her purse and her lunch bag. It was dressed like your friend day, and she had on a purple shirt and black pants to match her friend and fellow math teacher, Sarah Giaquinta. Colleen taught her classes as usual, and as the day drew to a close, students and teachers said their goodbyes to her, not knowing that this would unfortunately be the last time they'd ever see her alive. It all began to unfold that night when police received a frantic call from a woman called Diana Chisholm. She called 911 at around 7 p.m. to report that her son hadn't come home yet and wasn't answering her calls or texts. This was not at all like him, and she had a feeling that something terrible had happened. Her son was Philip Chisholm, a 14-year-old freshman at Danvers High School. He'd recently moved with his mother to Danvers from Tennessee after his parents went through a difficult divorce. Philip had just recently enrolled in Danvers High School, where he joined the soccer team. He made a few friends at school and at the new church he and his mother started attending, but was usually quiet and stayed to himself most of the time. Police sent out an alert to patrol officers in Danvers and surrounding towns to be on the lookout for the missing teen and sent calls out to local residents. At around 9 p.m., a mass email was sent out to the school faculty and staff, asking if anyone had seen Philip or had any information on where he might be. People don't usually go missing in the small town of Danvers, but things would start becoming strange after police receive another call just hours later from another parent reporting their child missing. It was Colleen's parents. They called the police at 11.20 that night and said that she usually comes home at 3.30, but they haven't heard from her since she left the house that morning. When they drove down to her school earlier that evening, they found her car parked outside, but Colleen was nowhere to be found. 
They spent the next few hours reaching out to her friends and co-workers, and decided to finally report her missing when nobody knew where she was. There were now two missing people who were last seen at Danvers High School, which by this point was already closed. Sarah Giaquinta replied to the email sent out about Philip being missing. She said that she stopped by Colleen's classroom after school and had actually seen Philip inside her classroom after all the other students had already left. Colleen's frantic parents couldn't wait for police to launch a search and went out looking for her that night along with a bunch of her friends and co-workers. They didn't find Colleen, but someone spotted an empty purse on the ground near the school. As soon as Colleen's parents confirmed it was hers, everyone's worries turned into serious concern for her safety. Meanwhile, Danvers police pinged Philip's phone and tracked it to a movie theater nearby. By the time officers arrived there, it seemed that he'd already left. Just after midnight, police in the nearby town of Topsfield spotted someone walking down an empty road with a satchel over his shoulder and stopped to question him. When he identified himself, officers were relieved to find out that they'd just found the missing teen from Danvers. Philip was brought back to the police station to be picked up by his mother. As part of their protocol, they frisked him and had him remove his satchel to be searched. An officer opened it and found his keys, his wallet, and some clothes, among other things. But then he found some strange items. In the bottom of the satchel was a hunting knife, a flashlight, and a bag with more things inside. In that bag were another set of keys, a pair of women's underwear, and another wallet. When the officer opened the wallet, he found Colleen's ID and credit cards and a box cutter with the blade covered in blood. He asked Philip whose blood that was, and Philip said, it's the girl's. When asked where this girl was, Philip replied, buried in the woods. The officer was shocked, but kept his composure and asked him if the girl could be helped if she was found, to which Philip replied, no. The officer started taking a closer look at the rest of his things. When he unfolded Philip's clothes, he found them covered in blood. Philip was immediately arrested and transported to Danvers police. Back in Danvers, the search for Colleen intensified as local and state police dispatched officers and canine units. By 3 a.m., detectives arrived at Danvers High School and gained access to the school's surveillance system. As they reviewed the footage from earlier in the day, they watched a murder take place just feet from where they were standing. After class was finished and students left school for the day, Philip stayed behind in Colleen's class with her as she was getting ready to go home. This is when Sarah stopped by Colleen's class for a brief conversation with her and saw Philip sitting inside. After she leaves, Colleen steps out and heads to the bathroom. Philip walks out right behind her and looks around to see if there's anyone else in the hallway. As Colleen enters the bathroom, he steps back into the class for a second, then comes back out with his hood over his head and follows her. He pulls out a pair of gloves from his pocket and puts them on just as he walks in after Colleen. Eleven minutes later, a female student walks into the bathroom, then quickly turns back and leaves. This student later testified that when she walked in, she saw someone leaning over a sink with no pants on and a pile of clothes by their feet. She said that she left because she didn't want to disturb this person, thinking that they were changing. Seconds after she leaves, Philip walks out and makes his way down the hallway, holding what would later turn out to be Colleen's pants and underwear. As he approaches the stairway, he reaches for his hood to pull it over his face, and blood can be seen covering his right hand. He leaves the building, then runs back inside after two minutes without Colleen's clothes or the sweatshirt he was wearing. He makes his way back to the classroom, where he picks up his bags along with a different hoodie that he happened to have, then leaves the building for a second time. After stashing his bags somewhere, he returns to the second floor, wearing a ski mask, which he also happened to have with him. As he re-enters the bathroom, he spots his friend Ramsey, who tries talking to him, then quickly removes his ski mask and turns around to lead him away from there. The two of them had planned to meet at the soccer field for practice, but Philip never showed up and Ramsey came looking for him. He asks Philip what he's doing, and Philip tells him he's looking for something that he'd lost, as he continues leading him away from the bathroom. Ramsey later testified that Philip was sweating profusely and seemed scared, and that he followed him outside and watched him drag a large recycling bin back inside the building. He once again asked him what he was doing, and Philip said nothing, and told him to go back to the soccer field and wait for him there. 
Ramsey went back, but Philip never showed up. Philip brings the empty bin upstairs and rolls it into the bathroom. After five minutes, he comes back out with his face covered, dragging the bin, which now seems to be much heavier. He takes it to the elevator to bring it to the first floor, then rolls it out of the school and around the building, passing by a man and his dog along the way. Another student would later testify that they watched Philip attempting to drag the heavy bin up a steep rocky incline into the woods behind the school. He wasn't able to and brought it back around and found another way into the woods, where he spent the next 25 minutes. Philip then reappears on camera without the bin or his shoes. As he makes his way back upstairs, large bloodstains can be seen on his pants, but Philip had a plan for that too. He walks over to his locker, where he picks up some clothes, then goes into another bathroom and walks back out after two minutes with a whole new outfit on. After this, he exits the school once more and goes back into the woods, where he spent the next 12 minutes. He went to dispose of his bloody jeans, but it's not clear what else he did there during that time. On his way back to the school, Philip runs into another friend by the name of Kevin, who would also later testify at his trial. He told the court that he knew Philip through church and that their relationship had been building toward a close friendship. He spoke with Philip about church and homework and said that he seemed like his normal self. After they finish talking, Philip once again goes back into the school where he roams around through the halls for a few minutes and enjoys a snack before he finally leaves for the last time. He heads straight to the movie theater to catch a movie at 4.40 and uses Colleen's credit card to purchase the ticket. After this, he went to a Wendy's where he had some lunch, also using Colleen's credit card. After reviewing this footage, detectives knew that Colleen was most likely already dead and that her body had to be somewhere near the school. As officers searched the woods behind the school, they spotted a pink toenail in the dirt. Colleen's body had just been found in what looked like a disturbing scene out of a horror movie. Her body was found posed in a sexually suggestive position with a large, gaping, V-shaped wound around her neck. The only clothing she had on were her shirt, which was pulled up, and her bra that had been pulled down. Her legs were spread out, and between them was a tree branch protruding from her body. A note was left right next to it which read, I hate you all. The recycling bin was found nearby, along with the white gloves and the jeans that were disposed of earlier, all covered in blood. After Colleen's body was transported to the medical examiner, an autopsy revealed even more gruesome details. Her death was determined to have been caused by a combination of strangulation and multiple cuts to her throat. She was raped while being strangled. After the rape, her throat was cut multiple times while she was still being strangled. There were so many slits and stab wounds in her neck that it was impossible to determine how many times she was cut or stabbed. It was completely mangled and looked like one large gaping wound. The autopsy also concluded that any one of those cuts or stabs could have been fatal on their own, as her jugular vein was severed multiple times. An expert for the prosecution would later testify in Phillips' trial. Dr. Eugene Barrison, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and a specialist in adolescent psychiatry, testified that cases like this one were off the charts rare. He added, I personally have never seen anything like this in the hundreds of cases I've had and the thousands of cases I've supervised. Colleen's funeral was held on October 28th, and over 1,000 people from her small town attended it. Colleen Ritzer was only 24 years old. Her body was buried in Spring Grove Cemetery. Philip Chisholm was charged with first-degree murder, robbery, and two counts of aggravated rape. He was held without bail, and his trial was set for November 15th, 2016. Under Massachusetts law, the court was required to try him as an adult. However, before his trial even began, Philip caught another case while being held in jail. News Center 5's Jim Loke is live from juvenile court in Boston with the details. Jim. Erica, good afternoon. Considering the legal troubles he's facing, his problems are far from over. The new charges stem from an alleged incident at this Dorchester youth detention facility last month. This morning, with his mother barely looking on, prosecutors laid out the attack, describing how Philip Chisholm allegedly spent the day eyeing up a 29-year-old female clinician, eventually sneaking by a distracted staffer and into a private staff-only bathroom where he pounced. 
The victim was trying to scream, but it was ineffective because her airway was closed by virtue of the defendant strangling her. The defendant took his free right hand and started punching the victim in the head with his right hand. The motive against the woman was never made clear, but prosecutors say the attempted murder charge is justified, invoking the Colleen Ritzer case without ever mentioning her name. His intent to murder is also proven by his conduct in October of 2013 when he followed a 24 year old female school teacher into a bathroom in Danvers High School and there assaulted her and murdered her. And while the prosecutors went through the formalities of bail for Chisholm, $250,000, it's a moot point. He's already being held without it in the Ritzer case. And when told not to have any contact with alleged witnesses, the only word we heard from him. Do you understand that order, Mr. Chisholm? Yes. Philip was charged with attempted murder for his second assault. At his first trial for Colleen's murder, his defense didn't deny that he killed her. Instead, they argued that he had a psychotic episode that was triggered by something Colleen had said to him. Another student who briefly stopped by the classroom after school testified that while drawing on Colleen's board, she heard Philip telling Colleen where he was from and that when Colleen asked him if he missed Tennessee, his demeanor suddenly changed. He seemed to get annoyed and started giving her one-word answers. After this interaction, Colleen stepped out to speak with Sarah Giaquinta, who also gave her testimony. After talking with Colleen for a few minutes, she asked her if she needed to get back to her students. Colleen said that the female student was just drawing on the board and that she had no idea why Philip was there. The defense claimed that Philip and his family members had a history of mental illness and asked the jury to find him not guilty by reason of insanity. They also brought in a psychiatrist who testified that Philip suffered from depression and that he had a brief psychotic episode at the time of the murder. However, the prosecution brought their own expert witnesses who testified that the results of Philip's mental evaluation indicated that he was pretending to be severely mentally ill and that while he did exhibit signs of stress and emotional disturbance, he was most likely not suffering from a mental illness. They also highlighted the fact that he brought gloves, a ski mask, a box cutter, and a change of clothes with him to school that morning as clear evidence that he carefully planned this murder. The trial lasted about a month Philip was ultimately found guilty of first-degree murder, robbery, and one of the two rape charges. The jury felt that the prosecution did not prove that Colleen was still alive when she was violated with the tree branch and acquitted Philip of his second rape charge. Massachusetts does not have a law which criminalizes the abuse or mishandling of a corpse. On February 26, 2016, Philip was given the maximum sentence allowed by law for juveniles, life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years. Philip's second case has not yet been scheduled for trial. For the sentence in his first case, he won't be eligible for parole until he's in his mid-50s. Colleen's family was not happy with the outcome of the trial and released a statement criticizing the court saying, today's sentence is unacceptable. Colleen's devastated parents also gave victim impact statements at Philip's sentencing. Her mother Peggy said that her daughter's death had left her, so very broken. She continued, Now I isolate myself from people I love because pretending to be happy is so difficult. He is pure evil, and evil can never be rehabilitated. Colleen's father, Tom Ritzer, said, It makes me sick to know that I walk the same halls as her killer. It makes me sick to know I drove by her in the woods and drove home. A dad's job is to protect his family. I didn't protect Colleen. A dad's job is to fix things. I can't fix this. Philip's mother, Diana Chisholm, later released a written statement through her lawyer which read in part, Words can't express the amount of pain and sorrow these past two and a half years have been. However, there is no one who has suffered more than the Ritzer family. My utmost esteem, prayers, and humble respect is with them today as they continue their journey to heal. Colleen's family created a scholarship in her honor called Colleen E. Ritzer Memorial Fund to continue her legacy of educating young people and has provided scholarships to dozens of aspiring teachers 